Okay, welcome. Here we are, meetings with masters, with an amazing soul, a dear friend, and an incredible survivor of unimaginable um, events in her life. Catherine M. Ann Wilson, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank I you. I appreciate being back with you. This is wonderful. And also, what, what a gift that you're not doing this one live. You know, we're going to talk about, you know, serious stuff today and just allowing me the safety of being able to talk to you without being on live so that I don't feel that pressure. <laughs> So I can be like, you and I are having this conversation and our first talk was live and that was fantastic. I loved it. And I think most of them are live, but you know, just, I just appreciate having this space here to just you and I like couple girls having girl talk. <laughs> yeah, we were just together and it was just wonderful. And I really wanted to have been wanting to do this because of course, what my mission is with, with my, with my show meetings with masters, masters is to what I call elevated conversations of people in personal growth who are mastering, you know, per, mastering personal growth and contributing to humanity in, 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 in big ways. And, um, and of course that's how we came together, um, which I am beyond grateful for that we came together through Tony Robbins community, Tony Robbins community. Um, and so here we are last time we met, we talked, you shared so much about, uh, you shared a lot about your life in what you've been through, which is, you know, again, unimaginable abuse as a child, uh, became a runaway and were, were trafficked, um, which is, which is, you know, to, again, to me, it's, it's, uh, I can't, I can't even fathom. And so what I wanted to do today, because we heard so much of the, there about what the work you're doing for humanity in prevention and, um, and, and helping others to learn how to, uh, well, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well, but how to, how to be more in a place of prevention and be loving parents and, and to, um, stop traffic, trafficking us.org is your, well, stop trafficking us is your, is your nonprofit organization, correct? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, and I'll let you share about that. And then what I'd like you to do when you're ready, um, is what I really want to know is what life was like for, for Catherine and Wilson, like what, what, what was life like for you growing up in, in this way? <clears throat> so you and I had a great conversation when you were here and what a gift <laughs> to have you. Um, Me too. Usually when I'm, when I'm, when I'm a guest on somebody's show, I want to use that as an educational opportunity to teach the community, you know, what is human trafficking? And under that umbrella of human trafficking, you know, what is that? And the three, the three components of human trafficking, the labor trafficking, organ, organ trafficking, and sex trafficking, and what is the definition? And what's the difference between uh, sex trafficking and prostitution? And like all these sort of basic things I, I see being a guest as an opportunity to teach, inspire, and motivate people ultimately to do their own work and to protect children from being sexually abused in the first place, which is the genesis of so much, you know, addictions, incarceration, dysfunction, blah, blah, blah. Rarely do I just uh, take up very much time sharing what my particular story is uh, for a couple reasons. One, it, we're limited by time, and I, I feel like the best use of that time is to focus on, on what I just said. The other thing is, is sometimes people have a reaction to some of the details of my story, and I want to protect people from that. But you have specifically said, you know, Kat, I just want to know more about your story so that I can understand where you were and what, you know, what was your journey to healing that to be, you know, the friend to me that you are today. And I'm, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. And that's why we agreed to meet a second time. It's beautiful. And I'm happy to do it. I do want to start 
with the caveat just sort of, you know, out there that the people who are listening understand that, you know, some of this stuff is pretty graphic and it's hard to hear. And if you're somebody who, um, not even easily triggered, if you're triggerable, this might do it. You might get triggered. And so if you're watching, you know, just imagine a bubble, you know, like when you're a kid and you dunk the thing in, you blow bubbles, you know, that iridescent color, just put a bubble of love around you and just consciously put your feet on the ground and feel grounded and protected. And if you have that feeling, this, this is recorded. You can watch it later. Um, you can leave the room. You can, you probably shouldn't have kids or, or, or sensitive people in the room with you. Just be conscientious that this is a hard topic and, and we don't want to um, negatively impact anybody. Mm. So um, one of the things that is unique about my story is that we know that the greatest percentage of victims um, can fall under children of color, children who are in the system, they're in the foster care system, they're, you know, somehow they're in the system. Um, the things that would make somebody um, more vulnerable, and I don't normally talk about that when I'm sharing about human trafficking, sex trafficking, because I don't want people to think that they're safe just because which is a big deal. And I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to use up our time on a teaching moment, <laughs> right? But uh, all children are vulnerable. And, you know, I, I was conceived in love. My mom and dad were middle income people. And I was the first grandchild. My grandmother had two boys and my dad was the oldest and I was the first grandchild. And I was um, conceived in love. I was brought in um, into this world, absolutely loved and adored. And my dad's mother, my grandmother, I was such a gift. She had two boys and I was the girl and she just <laughs> loved me. And her love for me is the thing, you know, that we know in resilience, and I'm not going to go into ACEs and resi resilience and turn this into a teaching moment, to reel myself in. Um, I know. But, but we know that when one person, you have one person who believes in you, one person that loves you, it, it absolutely, it has a huge uh, difference. I mean, it is just amazing between um, children who had somebody and who didn't have somebody. I had somebody. My grandmother loved me. So um, my baby brother was born shortly after after me, uh, 17 months or something, and and he had asthma, and like like really like really bad asthma. Um, his first 10 Christmases were in the. Um, like oxygen tents in the, in the mm. ICU for kids, you know, um, actually the Palm beach, uh, we lived in Florida in the wintertime in Maine in the summer. And there's a, uh, the cover of the Palm beach, um, newspaper with my brother with his finger up his nose and the oxygen tent and Santa Claus visiting. <laughs> you know? I'm sure that picture my mom, anyway. So, um, you know, he, he was sick and, my parents were distracted and, and we know that predators are opportunistic and um, my school, one of the school administrators knew about my brother and my family. And so it really wasn't an, it wasn't a red flag for anybody that he was coming into my class, taking me out of my first grade classroom, bringing me into his office, calling me his special little girl and um, molesting me in his office. Um, so I was in first grade. And what I remember about that time was, and, and really for, the, for a good chunk of my life, just sort of feeling confused. Like, I don't think that what's happening to me or what my life was like was supposed to be that way. Of course, I didn't have anything to base that on. I was just a little kid. 
Um, and, and as is common for children who are sexually abused, that one, uh, that one person abusing me was not the first, you know, and, and I, the analogy I use is like blood in the water of sharks. Here they come, you know, or, you know, it's just somehow this radar goes out and, and I won't use this as a teaching moment either, but Harvard did do a study on how come two women are running down Central Park at dusk. One person has a history of being sexually abused, one doesn't. The odds of the one who's been sexually abused is far greater to be abused again. Um, it, it, so I don't know. Um, well, so, by the way, it's okay to pop in the teaching moments that I think are yeah. important. I, mean, I, know. They're, they're, I, go, I go off on tangents, Gina, and <laughs> so, you know, our, our hours. So, yeah. um, so it was, you know, him. And then it was, you know, uh, we moved to a different house when I was 10. So we weren't there long. And I remember, you know, bedwetting and um, nightmares. I don't remember telling my, my mom and dad about him. Uh, but I do remember the nightmares and the bedwetting and all of the sort of the red flags. And when my mom and dad brought that to the attention of our pediatrician, they said, well, you know, um, there's a lot of stress in the home with a very sick child in the home. And so they just akin it, you know, sort of wrote it off and understandably so that that was that. And then we moved into the, the uh, next house, new neighborhood, and it was the babysitter and it was the friend of the family. And it was, you know, somebody's, we called her a cousin, friend of the family, you know, woman. So there's lots of um, myths, you know, like um, wouldn't happen to um, middle income white child uh, with both parents. Um, it, would, it would be uh, just a boy that would do it, not a girl. Uh, that somebody who works in a school certainly wouldn't do that. So we, you know, we, we learn that, you know, predators are everywhere. And so now I'm behaving differently in school and the chicken or the egg, right? Like, would I have been, uh, you know, a little odd kid if I hadn't been sexually abused? I don't know, but I do know that our, our situation was a little different. You know, my parents owned and operated camps uh, on a small lake in Maine we had 13 little cottages on a, on a lake, and that was like a fun summer thing that we, that we did. And we would go up to Maine like a month or so before school ended to, you know, rake and open up the camps and, you know, work to get, to get our, our summer business ready. My dad was a union master electrician, so he could, he could do that. And then we would leave a month or so after school had already started so I would come back to school in Florida and the kids had already bonded. So there's, mm. you know, it's not, it's not clear cut. And the road that human beings go through in dysfunction, addictions, abuse, it's not a clear, it's not a clear line. And there are other factors to consider. So, um, you know, I've been sexually abused. I'm, I'm uh, going back and forth, Maine, Florida, I'm in, the, and I am, I'm five feet and a, and a quarter of an inch right now. Right. <laughs> right. I love it that you and I get to see eye to eye in person. Yes, um, right, right there with you. Uh, yeah. So I would, I would think I was like next to the smallest kid in the entire elementary school. And mm. so was it that? Um, was it whatever? Um, but I was... Uh, just horribly bullied in school. You know, there's, if you think back of your own to your own elementary school experience, you remember there's like that one kid that everybody picked on. Um, it just worked out that there's that one kid. Uh, uh, there was a special needs kid, uh, Gus, who was in my school uh, and he was special needs. He would eat the heads off of frogs and pick his nose and do disgusting things with it and all that. And, and maybe he was uh, bullied more than I was, um, but I gave him a run for his money. Mm -hmm. So I'm being um, bullied and I learned uh, to be sexual. You know, that was like 
that was my energy. I, I wanted nothing more in life at that time than to fit in, to be seen, to be heard, to be, um, to be loved, like the greatest thing in the world that I wanted more than anything else was to belong and to be loved. I didn't mm. want to be the most popular kid. I just wanted somebody to like me, you know, mm. and, and what my reality was, was that kids would call me if they had a problem. You know, I was the kid that people called if they had a, a problem and then they would add in, but if you tell anybody that I'm calling you, I'll never call you again because it, they had to be careful because if they got caught being my friend, then they would be ostracized as well. Um, and, and as the, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade was happening in sixth grade, the, the level of bullying got to a point that the school administrators had to get involved because they, there was so much damage done to the schools. People were taking their own feces and writing on the bathroom walls. Big, the big science book, every single page. And just randomly, you walk in, you pick up a book, you sit, you sit down. Big science book, Mr. Quisenberry's class. My name was on every single page on that book. Um, uh, the girls didn't like me and the boys, uh, the boys did. And I became uh, sexual early. I mean, I had been That's sexual. That's you were shown. Very early. Yeah. So, so that, you know, that was just sort of, um, uh, they could go to, to first and second and third base with me. Um, and so I was promiscuous. And it was worth it to me because I got to have that little bit of human contact and kindness. Um, they didn't want to be, they didn't want to talk to me during the day. Um, they didn't want to acknowledge me during the day, but for a minute, I got a little bit of attention. So by 12, um, I start running away. Um, so this my, was around 12 that you, this was. Yeah. Because you had already been being sexually abused, so your body was feeling right. that. And yeah. okay, so, so twelve. You're now yeah, we're at twelve. Okay. I'm twelve, and my mom and dad start having. You know, there's three children now. You know, and my mom and dad are going through their own reality. You know, and their own reality is they had me, then they had um, my my brother who was really sick. They had a third child that um, died of crib death, Stephen. Can't even imagine what that was like for my mom. And then, um, uh, you know, they wanted to hurry up, like when you lose a dog, hurry up and have another one. So she, you know, she had my sister and then their marriage, you know, this is in the seventies and, you know, you can bring them the bacon and fry it up in a pan and the women's movement and, you know, and a lot of a real push for women to get out of being a homemaker and, you know, get into the work. Course. Of course. So my mom and dad are having their own reality, and and they thought that the bullying of me handling that on my own would um, would uh, build character in me. <laughs> and it and it I don't think that they realized the level of bullying that was that was going on. So my my mindset at the time is um, I am. My only value is I can help people with their problems and uh, boys can have their way with me, sometimes girls. Back then, um, you know, 12, uh, you know, if somebody was brave enough to come over, if a girl was brave enough to do a, an overnight with me, you know, I, I was being mutual, mutual being sexual with them too. So Exploration. Sex, sex was just a thing, you know, it was just something. And I, I never did get what I was longing for, which was feeling like I belonged and feeling like I was wanted or protected or anything. And the, the bullying got to the point where now I'm skipping school a lot. And my parents weren't really paying attention because now their marriage is sort of falling apart. And so I'm not even going to school. 
And when you don't go to school, you know, the vultures are sort of, you know, the hyenas are waiting on the, the, the outskirts of the tribe, right? You know, there's mm-hmm. the, there's the pack of, of zebras and there's the hyenas just waiting for those, which is exactly what predators do. So I'm um, now I'm running away at 12. So from 12 to 17, I'm running away. First, I'm going to people's houses that, you know, I wish were my friend, you know, that seems really cool. And I'm, I'm running away to their house. And the thing is, when you run away to somebody's house, if those adults in the family aren't calling your parents, aren't calling the authorities, there's usually a reason for that. And yes. so now it is their dad, their uncle, their big brother. I'm waking up with somebody's hand over my mouth, dragging me out of bed onto the floor into some hallway or another room. And they're being sexual with me. Um, what are you going to do? You're going to say something, you know, you're then, then what? So you can't really say anything. And there's a whole subculture, a whole way of being as a runaway. So I quickly learned that uh, staying in somebody's house wasn't safe for me. And so I would, and by the way, at that time, you know, we didn't have cell phones. I would make a phone call usually every day and, you know, call home and let them know that I was alive. So I had, that was sort of one of the cadence, one of the things that I regularly did is just let my parents know I was alive. And I watched too much television, so I thought they could trace the call so I wouldn't stay on the phone very long, but just let them know I was alive. And occasionally, you know, I'd come back home for a little while. So now my parents, I think 13, you know, my parents um, uh, get a divorce and my mom and my little brother and sister, they go to live in Boca Raton. And I stay and still, my dad's still going back and forth to Maine, Florida. And the kids are going back and forth to Maine, Florida. Um, but in Florida, they get divorced and I'm the oldest. And I love my dad. Like, I thought my dad was God. I thought he had the answer to every world problem because on television, when they would show a world problem, he would say what the answer was. And it sounded brilliant to me. So um, loved my dad. And so I'm going to like stay, uh, I'm going to take care of my dad. I'm going to stay with him. And I, I try that. And this is, um, so timing is a little funny for survivors. So just, um, just bear with me. So this 13, 14 period. And then, um, and at this age, when I go up to Maine, it's my uncle, it's my aunt, it's the, you know, the, the, um, the sexual abuse from different people doesn't stop. As I get into that age, that 10 to 14, 15, 16, that six-year period, that is like prime, the majority of um, offenders, that's like their prime um, target, that age, oh. that, that um, when you start to develop, but you're not fully developed yet. I mean, there are people that like the little kids, um, and babies even, um, mm. uh, but you know, this, that 10 to 16 is really, um, really good, particularly little like me, where you're not quite developed <clears throat> moves more into the 16 because, uh, I'm, I, I look like I'm, you know, that 12, 13 period. So, okay. um, and, um, um what, can I just back up for one second with the earlier years, was there physical, um, I mean, I mean, there has to be physical abuse because you're probably getting torn apart. And I'm just, I, I just, um, I'm just, I can't imagine. That's all I can imagine. So go on. Mm -hmm. The the school administrator didn't uh, penetrate me with his penis. Um, That would have been um, more obvious. I would have been holding my vagina. I would have like Ah. maybe said something to my mom. Uh, He did other things and had me do other things to him. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, but, uh, everybody else did, everybody else had, um, you know, uh, the women, um, of course use their hands or other things. Um, men was always intercourse. Um, 
Anyway. And I don't mean to get so graphic, but the reason is only because there's so many people that are going to watch that have been through it. And when it, it just almost, I can't imagine, I haven't been through it, but I. Right. So, um, yeah. So you, and you just, um, and it sounds so unbelievable. And, uh, but this is, yeah. Yeah, this is my truth. So, right. um, so I've intercourse a bunch of times, uh, rape at one at one point um, at one point uh, well actually I'll back up so I'm with my dad and um, you know how kids are you're sitting you're you're laying on the carpet you know the shag carpet in front of the television and you're just sitting there you know watching whatever and my dad um, my I grew up with Playboy magazines on the coffee table it was just a thing um, not penthouse magazines but playboy magazines just they were always there um but now dad has a penthouse magazine which is um, a harder core level of pornography and in okay. the back of that magazine people would write in and, and it, uh it was an, uh, the article um the segment's called forum and that forum uh, each month, I don't know, I guess monthly, um, people would write in their sexual fantasies, things that they had done, stories, um, pornographic stories. So I'm, you know, sitting there and dad throws a um, magazine next to my head and, hey, that's an interesting article, you know, dog-eared. And it was uh, fathers and daughters having sex. Oh. And that, that was okay, that that, you know, hey, this is an acceptable thing. We didn't talk about it, but what what people do is they don't, teaching moment, um, they don't just um, all of a sudden have sex with the kid. That's that's not the norm. The nor although that happens, um, you know, that's rape. But there is a grooming. There is there's stuff that happens that they work up to. It's like a desensitization. It's like the frog. Do you throw the frog in the boiling water, jumps out, or do you slowly turn up the heat, right? Mm -hmm. So for groomed children, it is a slowly turning up the heat. Uh, seasoned predators, seasoned offenders might have, you know, we in, in the Tony tribe, we talk about the funnel, right? You got to have right. so many in the funnel to close the sale. Well, mm -hmm. that's what they're doing with children because it might take a year to be, to get um, permission to be sexual with that child, or it might be a month or it might be a week, but there's different levels. You know, the average assaults of the career of assaults for an offender is 150 times. Not somebody that has a higher sex drive or who has greater access to kids. Just the average, the average offender does this 150, 150 times. So, and they're fully aware of the consequences. So you have to try to get buy-in as much as you can um, in order to not get caught. So there, it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole way. It's a, it's a subculture. It's a lifestyle really. And, um, and there's, there's a lot to it, but when and I, and you were already getting it from your, your uncle, uh, your, your, right. your, the aunts and uncles were already attacking you. I already had an, an uncle, an aunt, uh, friends of the family, uh, people that would come up to the campground, um, Right. Yeah. So, um, and then being a runaway, you get into a situation that you, you can't get out of and you know, you're, you, somebody tells you they're giving you a ride somewhere, um, when really they're bringing you to their house, um, and you're, then they tie you down, um, and they're on whatever drug and they think it, you know, it's their idea of a good time to take a, you know, 13 year old kid and, and handcuff them ankles and wrists and, you know, just, uh, rape you, rape you all night long, let you go in the morning, pat you on the head and say, you know, you know, bye. 
um, on, tell anyone. <laughs> going to work or whatever. And then I'm wondering, you know, how, how do I, where am I? Um, and how am I going to get a ride somewhere safe? You know, um, you, when you are in, when you are in the throes of this world, you know, this subculture world, your brain isn't thinking the way other people's brains think. You know, it isn't an option to go to the police in our mind. Um, the police aren't a safe place to go. Um, and I'll come to that, that in just a moment. But my reality is, and what I didn't know when I was with my dad, and my dad is asking me to ask other people to have sex with him. I'm waking up in the middle of the night and he's in my bedroom. I start locking my door. Um, uh, and I'm thinking, my dad is going to have sex with me. I got to figure out, I got to leave. I have to leave. You know, I need to run yeah. away from my next place. My mind's not thinking, tell the authorities, call the Department of Health and Human Services. Didn't even know there was such a thing. There right. And you probably weren't thinking molestation because you had already been, you know, I mean, this. Yeah, yeah. No, I, all, all I was thinking, and which is what I thought uh, frequently, is, okay, this is happening. How can I avoid it? Right. How can I avoid it? How and then and then and then if I can't avoid it and the rape is happening, how can I get it over faster? You don't want to aggravate the person who's raping you and then have them beat you more or beat you at all or kill you. You know, how can you what can I do, say, whatever to get it over quicker, as quick as possible? Um, and to survive it with as little damage as possible. So that's that's what that's what I was thinking. So I see that this is happening with my dad, and I don't want to be sexual with him. Um, he's asked me to, to give him oral sex, and um, like saying what I feel like I need to say to dissuade him. I think I said I was, I know I said I was gay. Can't, I'm gay. And then like oh ran, ran out of the room. Um, inappropriate stuff like, um, you know, dad did have sex with somebody and he got crabs and he had me go through his pubic hair pulling out crabs. Um, you know, um, and that was... He's my dad. I have to take care of him. This is what I have to do. Um, you know, and then what do you, what do you do? You run away, you right. run away. Okay. So, and it wasn't in my thought to like call mom or call my dad's mom, my grandmother, or I, I just needed to run away because my thinking at the time was something's I'm in the wrong world. So that was the predominant thought that I had as a child was sure. God is good, um, but God has made a mistake. Yes, he, has, he has put me in the wrong world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Your I family should, wasn't safe. No one, it didn't. No, right. no and, I, and I never felt safe. I don't, rem I, I don't remember feeling like my home was a sanctuary, like my home was safe, like I was protected. You know, I felt like the feeling that I had for whatever reason was I am a burden, um, that they love me because I am their child, but not because I was adored. You know, I wasn't precious. I was a burden. Um, and, and that would be, those messages would be sort of hammered home um, I'm a bedwetter till 12, right? Um, you stop bedwetting when you're on the street. Um, was you can't spend the night over that person's house. Um, we don't want to, we don't want them to have to deal with the sheets. You can't do mm. this, you can't do that. You know, you're a burden, you're a burden, you're a burden. We, we, we wouldn't want to do that to them. Or, um, you know, we're up in, up in Maine and I'm listening to friends of my parents uh, I asked to do something and uh, some friends came up and dad let them stay in one of the, one of our cottages that wasn't rented that week. 
and I'm sitting on the on the step and I'm listening to my dad's dearest friends talk about me. Like I didn't sit there to eavesdrop. I just sat, I just walked out and just sat down um, on the on the stoop. And I'm listening to say, you know, poor my mom and dad, you know, that they're that they have a child like Kathy, um, you know, they don't deserve that, and the and the hell that she's put them through, right? And all I can think of was, how can I kill myself and take away this burden from my from my parents? Um, and then something happened. I think I went up to the bunkhouse to to get a knife and cut my wrist or something. But there was a guy and, you know, next thing you know, I'm off on whatever sort of sexual whatever. So anyway, so dad's dad's doing that. I run away again. And when so now I'm breaking into apartment buildings, Um, I'm breaking into, um, you know, condominiums. I'm I'm sleeping in people, you know, kids forts in the woods. I'm. I'm uh, stealing, I'm going through dumpsters, I'm eating out of dumpsters, I'm stealing food, um, you know, I'm, I, um, I ended up, I was living in this one place in Biddeford, because now I'm in Maine, um, I'm in this one place in Biddeford that was just, um, actually the building uh, had that was condemned, and the tenants needed to, you know, to leave, but I was there right before the tenants left, So, um, they let these, these people let me live with them, you know, three people in a bed. Um, they were so kind. They were wonderful, very, very poor people who were kind and let me, let me stay with them for a few months, but I felt a burden to them too. And that's what you were told you were. So you're going to feel that. (laughs) And they didn't want to have sex with me. So, um, you know, it was a, they didn't, anyway, they, they were interested in being sexual. They just saw this Thank little you. wild animal on the street, me, and they took me in. Uh, their last name was Joy. Thought that was kind of cool. And so, um, uh, yeah. so I had um, through a series of events. I'm leaving out, you know, a lot of the detail, but I ended up um, being given to a drug dealer in the worst part of town in one of the worst towns in Maine. He had a base through the, through the joys. Nope. Okay. So they were safe, safe, but I got away from them and through a series of events. I ended up in this place and in this building, the, the, um, uh, I did, I just met this guy's name was Paul and he brings me into, you know, he's agreed to let me stay with him. It was sort of like, um, a rescue dog, Right. I was like, he was, he was taking in the rescue dog. He was taking me in, um, uh, begrudgingly because his friend said, would you, you know, take her? I don't want her. Will you take her? And so he begrudgingly said, yes, he takes me to his, uh, apartment. As soon as we walk in the door, um, he brutally, uh, rapes me and says, that's this month's rent. So, um, So I am, um, physically I'm, you know, I'm, I'm beaten. I'm, I'm not in a good place. Um, and now there is a warrant, uh, uh, well, not quite yet. Um, my friend Tina has, has lost track of me. So you sort of have the subcultures. You sort of, um, have people that you stay in contact with. Now she's not, doesn't have contact with me. I don't have contact with anybody. I'm in a very bad place. But in this building, um, uh, this not condemned building where, where, where this guy Paul lives, on the second floor, he has a basement apartment. On the second floor, there are two women, I don't know how old, young. They have clothes. They obviously have their own apartment. And they feed me. So I've stopped menstruating um, I'm so malnutritioned at this point that I don't have periods. Um, 14-ish? 14-ish? Now I'm I'm, uh, 15-ish. Okay. 15, 16. And um, uh, these two girls uh, feed me macaroni and cheese with peas and tuna fish. And... um, (laughs) I was so hungry 
that when I ate the food, I could feel it going through my bloodstream. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so great. And um, they were, they were like, uh, I'm like, how, how do you have your own apartment? What do you do for work? Like, how, how is this possible? You know? And they said they go on dates. They don't say prostitution. They don't say their pimp beats them. They don't say they don't get to keep any of the money. They don't say, um, and I don't know what prostitution is really. Like, I don't think I really understand at this time in my life. Um, um, but they're saying we go, oh, we go on. They totally glamorized it. We go on dates. We have boyfriends that make sure we get our money. Um, you would be so good at this. Um, um, you know, they totally, you know, said all this stuff and they sold it to you. They sold, <laughs> yeah, they, it, to me. They, they sold it to me and, and they had me at tuna fish, you know, they had, right. me, you were starving. They had, they had me at feeding me and the guy mm. in the basement is, is awful. So th- I feel this feels like something that I have control over this. This feels like instead of people taking sex from me, um, you know, eat, eat like piranhas eating me like, and me scrounging like a dog out of dumpsters. Like I get to have sex with people that I choose. I get paid for it and I'm in control of me and I will have my own apartment and I will put myself through school and I will have clothes and maybe someday a car and, you know, okay. So they bring the, uh, the two, uh, there's two pimps. They said, come here tomorrow afternoon. So I do. And there are two men that, that are there, um, a white man and a black man, uh, and they call themselves on the street, salt and pepper and salt. Um, I didn't know at the time that he was a pimp wannabe, I didn't even know that they were pimps. All I know is there's a few guys here and uh, the black guy is kind of like the all state commercial that we see now. Mm -hmm. Handsome and charming and gregarious. I didn't know how evil he was, that he was a part of a system going up and down the East coast that he was making child pornography. He was making bestiality. He had dogs that had sex with women, girls, um, that they filmed and sold these, um, these videos. Um, I, I had no idea that he had so many girls. I didn't know he was a part of whatever. All I know is that I'm starving. I'm in this apartment with these two very happy women and um and they've sold me this and now I'm meeting these two guys and the the white guy was um he had really thick glasses a pencil thin mustache one eye kind of went off to the right and like a pocket protector you know like he was the epitome of a, a nerd guy and then here's the gregarious guy um and they said, you get to choose who you want to work with, right? Jeez. Languaging. Um, so from not only this moment, Gina, but all these synchro destiny moments before then and all these synchro destiny moments after then, There are so many moments where the universe interceded and protected me, you know, walking through a parking lot with like the dumpster didn't have any food and I was starving and I was like really starving and a stranger who was a witch, she was a Wiccan woman, uh, walks over to me, takes my hand and says, I can feel that you're starving. Uh, you can't stay here, but let me feed you. How weird is that? Fed me and then sent me on my way, right? 
just just these moments, these interesting moments. Well, this moment, I choose the white guy. Okay. Not because he's white, not because he's charming, not because I don't know why I chose the white guy, but I did. And that saved my life. I had no idea, but that saved my life. They bleach my hair. I'm, you know, I'm probably 89 pounds. Um, they give me a fake ID, uh, Diana Foster, and I was supposed to be 27. Oh my. <laughs> um, and now, oh um, now, and they give me the rules of the subculture. So, you know, in our Tony world, we, we have our own language. You yes. know, we know what, um, make your move, right? Yeah. We, we know what different things mean. Mm-hmm. So they started trying to teach me the subculture. Like um, if a pimp comes over to you um, uh, and, and asks you, you know, um, he can take, another pimp can take away your money um, if, you, if you don't know what to say to him. Um, you can't let another pimp in the house. Um, if you let another pimp in your house without your pimp being home, there's hell to pay. So, so there's a, it's like an invisible fence. So people will say, nobody had a gun to your head. Um, you could have, there were moments that you were, uh, that people weren't around you. You could have gotten away. But I'm telling you that there is a, a brainwashing, just like there's this grooming, like we talked about with the, with the frog. There is a, there is a brainwashing that happens and pimps are masters, particularly experienced pimps, are masters at knowing what will control you. Um, sometimes they use drugs. So wherever drugs are sold, girls, children, people are sold. Wherever people are sold, drugs are sold. So if you can imagine being madly in love with somebody and you just want to have sex with them all the time because you just want you just want to crawl in their skin, you love them so much, well, would you still feel that way if you had to have sex with them 25 times a day? Because they said yeah. so. <laughs> right. um, you know, so somebody that you love, you don't want to have sex 25 times a day with somebody that you love and adore during your honeymoon phase. Right. Never mind strangers that stink that you don't you're not attracted to that are that are hurtful to you that want to do weird things to you and you have no say so sometimes the pimps and pimps can be men and women will give you a little bit of a drug so that you can even do this right let's just keep you energized and happy so you can do what you're supposed to do because you have a quota to meet. You, know? you have a quota and not reaching that quota is going to equal whatever the pimp knows will freak you out. So drugs and alcohol don't affect me the way they affect other people. Um, my biology is just uh, different. If I could smoke a joint and drink a margarita with my friends, I would have, um, but I can't. Alcohol and drugs, even prescription drugs, you know, um, I get, I can't, I can't take any pain medication. I can't do no, you get reactions. I can't do Tylenol, right? So, So that was not a way to control me, but that is the way to control some people. So they would just do a little injection, um, maybe between your toes or somewhere where the Johns won't see marks on your body. Um, and so they can, do, you know, get through it. So there's all, there's all these uh, subculture things and there's the way that they manipulate you. For- and I'm going to stop for one second, just one second, uh, only because the, the, this, the reason uh, this to me is important is that if someone is... Uh, hearing this and is experiencing any of these things that are leading up like please pay attention please pay attention and and walk uh, uh, that's what i'm feeling i needed to say so i don't want go 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 on please so um so for me the 
what worked for, and sometimes it's love. Sometimes a pimp will, will uh, Romeo a vulnerable person and then um, make her fall in love with him, save the day, be her hero. And then if you loved me, you'll perform these sexual acts for the greater good and then make her um, a madam, right? We'll say, okay, so I need you, you're with me, we're a partner in this, and then turn this victim into a predator herself by Mm. having her watch the girls, beat the girls, motivate the girls, you know, whatever. So there's a, there's a lot to it and I'm trying to, you know, so for, for me, uh, the fear of going to Lowell, Massachusetts. So, you know, I was with Salt with some other girls, and we were kept, um, first he kept me in his own home um, with his wife and children, two, two young children um, in his home, and he had to figure me out. And then once he figured out how to manipulate me, how to control me, then he moved me into this house with other girls, with somebody, uh, the woman who watched over us and a guy who watched over us to make sure we didn't leave, right? And uh, uh, Pepper, the other guy, um, ha- he beats his women, he breaks their arms, I'm watching this, I'm seeing this, and uh and in the in the pornography that he makes, uh, what freaked me out was being held, physically held against my will. Um, whatever they would put stuff on the women that would make the dogs want to have sex with them, um, and so they would tell me those stories, see my reaction. Um, Salt made note of that, and so the threat to me was either killing me or sending me to Lowell, Massachusetts. So that, that is what kept me doing what I was told to do, including not calling my mom and dad. So now it's been a while, right? First it was Tina that didn't hear from me. And now my mom and dad hasn't heard from me. So now there is a warrant out for my arrest, um, Arrest, like, which is just one step more than missing person. It's a little bit beyond missing person. Okay, so uh, the warrant would get the cops' um, attention more than she's a missing person. I don't. I don't. Totally I got you. Okay. okay. So now, um, so my pimp is telling me, you know, he's taking me into places and showing me human beings being human beings, and he's. And he's brainwashing me, um, telling me that, you know, I'm not safe. The police are a part of um, the whole prostitution thing. Um, uh, Showing me letters from from the warden of the prison that he had escaped from. Um, Just all, all this information that terrifies me and keeps me manipulated to his advantage, okay? So so he's t- telling me this stuff, and he's like, just I'm just trying to give you little examples. Like, he would take me a no-moon night, take me down the road, and then turn off the lights on his car. You can't see your hand in front of your face. And then turn the lights back on, turn them off, turn them on, and say, that is how fast you gone. could be gone. I'm 16, you know, whatever years old. This, this, is, this is terrifying shit. So um, he brings me to the police station. I don't know what's, what's going on, but one day he brings me to the police station. And on the way there, he's saying, there's a warrant for your arrest. So like, how does he know this? But he makes it out like, of course I know it. I know everything. And in my mind... I think this guy is freaking Satan and he does know everything, right? Like he knows everything. Like he has eyes everywhere. This is what he's telling me. He's giving me evidence to that. So I believe it. I believe it. So he brings me to the police station. I go, I go in 
and um, to let them know that I'm not. And the, the guy that I see, the captain at the time, come on in. So here's the red flag for me. I go into this guy's office and my pimp is sitting right in the chair back there. Nobody asks me, no woman. There's no female cop that takes me away. There's no female cop that takes me away from the men and says, okay, you're safe. What's going on? Right. There's nothing like that. I go into this guy's office. My pimp is right there. This guy does this, leans back in his chair, and he's like, oh, I, I know your uncle. <sighs> As soon as he says that he's friends with my uncle, who, by the way, later on did seven years in prison for child molestation, not for me. Nobody, nobody talked to the rest of the kids. That was just what he did to his daughter. Oh my. And his wife did a year. <sighs> Hello. Um, so as soon as he says my uncle's name, I'm fucked. Like, you know. So I know, so that's in my world, right? In my subculture world, this is code for you are not safe. Right. So, so I say, yep, my uncle's a great guy. Yep, all is well. No, I'm not missing. All, you know, everything's cool. And he's like, okay, good. You know, tell, tell your uncle I said hi, you know, blah, blah, blah. I get up, my pimp gets up, walks me out. So, what is that telling me? I am not safe. I am not safe. I am not safe. And so you have to, you have to, um, so now I'm in this, uh, this other person's house. Um, one of the girl goes, one of the girls disappear. Would they have hurt you if you had said to the cop, I need help? Like what you're in the police station? Like, I don't know. Uh, That's, I'm not, you know, in my, so I'm not a grown up. You know, I am, I am a brainwashed, brainwashed, something year old person. And this cop is talking about my predator uncle. That's his friend. And nobody's asking me about the pimp who's sitting right there. I I just have to like, do what I'm told and do what I'm told is like, um, uh, there's hunters, uh, and a group of five hunters ordered, you know, prostitutes to go to this fancy hotel um and i'm one of the girls that's been called so i'm supposed to meet other girls at this hotel with these five hunters in their hotel room and i get there i'm the only girl no other girls show up do you think that my pimp says oh my gosh that's just too much um let me get you out of here more money for me, go. So I'm 16-ish, five hunters who probably have children my age, and they took turns. Oh, my God. So my mind, how can I survive this? How can I get through this as quickly as possible and get out? I told you earlier that there's subculture, you know, there's rules, right? And I said, one of the rules is you can't invite a pimp into your, into your, um, where you're into the premises. So I'm uh, asleep. I wake up to a knock at the door. My pimp isn't there. Um, I, I open the door. I see two pimps that I, or two men, I don't know that they're, I don't know if I know that they're pimps or not, but there's two men. I kind of recognize them. And I, without even thinking, I said, um, I think, I think Peter's going to be here soon. Come on in. Mm. What did I just do? You put yourself in massive, even more danger. (laughs) I just broke a rule. As soon as I said that, one of them got this smirk on his face, shoved me back. I'm on the couch, and the two of them did awful things to me. And all I can think of, 
all I can think of is, is Peter going to send me to Lowell, Massachusetts? You know, I'm not in the moment that these two guys are, 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 are raping me and, 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 uh, and, and delighted in it. They're delighted in doing this to Pete. They're teaching Peter a lesson for not training his bitches properly. And I'm getting what I deserve. And all I can think of is if, if I live through this, am I going to Lowell, Massachusetts? So the, and it's miraculous that I never got pregnant. I never got a sexually transmitted disease. Like I was on, Peter didn't have me. I wasn't walking around with condoms. I didn't have birth control. Um, my God, you know, um, were you having out of body? Like, I I don't, I can't even, uh, I I can't even imagine getting through those moments. Uh, but how you just, um, for, for, for me, you know, I, uh, because the sexual abuse for me, it started so young. I learned some tricks. I learned that as soon as somebody has an orgasm, it's over. So figure out how to, um, if, if you can, you know, you have, so you sort of have to figure out your person. So is this person, somebody that's totally into, um, hurting you? Um, then if you act like you're being hurt, will that make them have an orgasm faster? If you, if you act like you're not being hurt in defiance, does that mean they're going to hurt you more and take longer? Um, you, 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 ha- you sort of have to figure, you have to figure these things out. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, um, there are some rapes that are more, um, violent than others and that took a while to recover from, okay. um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, anal, you know, head down, anal eating head trauma, um, you know, having somebody, choke you to unconsciousness. And then when you come out of it, you don't have the luxury of saying, you know, I'm calling 911 or you, you, uh, when you're in my position at the time and somebody chokes you and you go limp in their hands, you go, you, you go unconscious, they drop you, wait for you to come to they're thinking, oh my God, I would have had murder on my hand. I would have had, you know, I would have had a mess to clean up. You know, what do I do? How you behave the second you come to is, is critical. Um, when I came to the first thing out of my mouth, you know, like I realized, okay, I'm still alive. Okay. Wow. I'm, um, I don't know what I did to upset you, but I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. You learn, you learn what you need to say and how you need to be in order to live. So, um, so, you know, people talk about sex trafficking, but really there's all this stuff that happens way before first grade, more sexual abuse, um, trouble at home, no protection, uh, promiscuity, uh, crazy, well, crazy bullying at school, promiscuity, um, running away, you know, the light running away and then holy shit. And then the more hardcore running away, um, and then this stacking of, uh, of sexual abuse, you know, I remember being in, in Florida and I had met in my running away time, I met a 19 year old boy who was so nice to me. He fed me, um, gave me cigarettes, um, told me that he was going to be moving, um, because the man that he was living with, who did the night, uh, the newspapers at night, you know, you, 
you stuff the newspaper in the plastic, and then you drive around throwing the people's newspapers in at night. Well, this guy was a chicken hawk. A chicken hawk might like little boys and little girls or just little boys or just little girls. This guy liked little boys and little girls. And, and this 19 year old had been living with his grandmother and this guy in Connecticut, somehow, I don't know the whole story, but somehow this guy got this boy and raised him to be his, his sexual, I don't know, um, sexually abused him, kept him out of school. They slept during the day. They worked at night and would, uh, right. And so, but now he's, he's too old. He's 19. So he has to go this. So the guy is sending him oh, back, God. back. Right. So I meet him and he's feeling lost because the guy who has bothered him, loved him, sexually abused him is now is completely disinterested in him and brings me to his apartment. We walk into the apartment and the bedroom door is open and that man is having sex with my 15 year old uh, school kid I know from school who lives with his grandmother. Oh, I'm watching this sexual act. So not only, and I'm, and I'm watching uh, this guy give this boy to other men you know they drive like they're like they know where the pedophiles are and if they get a boy they share the boy with the other pedophiles so um uh not only do you, are you having stuff happen to you but you're also watching things that nobody would even be- believe like you're seeing stuff so now what i'm going to tell you you're going to understand how miraculous it is because of everything I just told you. Okay. So I, I'm trying to instill in you as much as I can, the understanding of how brainwashed I was. Okay. Hopefully you understand how terrified I was. Uh So, um, so now I'm allowed to go in the backyard. So where where I'm staying is very rural. It's you know a long way sure. in between houses. Um, and so I am I'm allowed to go in the backyard. So I'm in the backyard, and um, and it was such a joy for me because one of the neighbors' dogs had puppies. And, um, and the puppies, I could hear the puppies, but anyway, so I'm in the backyard and, um, and I'm trying to figure out how to kill myself. And, um, you know, I've told you, you know, a few of the rapes, a few of the horrific sexual experiences. Um, I have countless more and I remember every single one of them but I just wanted to give you an idea of them so I'm in the backyard and um you know maybe my family went to church you know once a year maybe Christmas or Easter or something so we weren't we weren't a religious family but I I went outside and and there was trees. And I said, I don't know if you are real or not. Now, let me back up one second. There was one point that I ran away from home and I ended up with a lady who took me with her to Cape Girardeau, Missouri from Florida. And I lived with them for a little while, with her for a little while. But, um, you know, her brother was having sex with me. Her uncle was having sex with me. And they were going to the first church, um, uh, uh, this Baptist church. 
and I and I and I um, they were they were having a revival, and um, and I did get baptized in the river. Didn't stop the men from having sex with me, um, but I did have that spiritual experience. And I was at the um, the church turkey shoot when uh, one of the women. I think one of the women that wanted to have sex with one of the guys that was molesting me um, called the police. And so I was arrested and brought to the juvenile detention center there and then shipped um, uh, back home. Why would she call the police on you? Just because she... I was trouble. You know, she... you were troubled. I mean, for goodness sakes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, um, and I, I was arrested another time. Um, I was, I had, I was living in um, an empty apartment building, and I wanted a towel so I could take the take a bath and use a towel. So I stole it. I stole a towel out of Dillard's department store and was arrested for that, and um, and brought back um, to mom. So I've been arrested three or four times, I guess, in my life. But anyway, so I'm just saying that while, back I'm, to that. while I'm in the backyard and I'm um, having I'm having a talk with God, I just wanted to let you know that I did have a relationship with God. So, kind of. Um, right. So I'm, so I'm saying, look, I don't really know if you're real or not, but, um, and I'm, and I'm saying this out loud, I'm having this conversation and I'm like, um, so what if reincarnation is real? And if I kill myself, you get punished for killing yourself by being reincarnated into something that is worse than life the way I know it is. Like, how could that like, you know, be worse? Um, are uh, what if hell is real and you kill yourself and you get punished for killing yourself by going to hell and hell is worse than what you're living right now. So I, and I, and I'm saying this just, just like this. And I said, um, so I am afraid to kill myself because I don't know for sure. Right. But I don't want to live either. I really don't want to be alive anymore. anymore. Mm -hmm. And that feeling lasted a very long time. I was in my 40s before that feeling left. So um, if you are real then help me. And I, um, and you know, Steph's spotty. Like I don't, I don't remember if it was like that day or the next day. I don't really remember, but, um, I, I was walking down. So remember how brainwashed I was. So for me to go into the front yard was a big deal. Okay. Because if Peter drove in, not like he said when he was coming, you know, um, well, I could make something up. But if I was on the road, less so. If I was down the road, less so. And if I was further down the road, Lowell, Massachusetts. Got it. Okay. So I am walking down the road. I am walking down the road. I'm walking <laughs> down the road. And um, the first house that I got to was on the left. And I knocked on, I saw there was a car in the drive, knocked on the door. The lady goes to open the door. And as soon as it was open, I like ran and rushed her and went right into her house. And I, and I said, I'm in trouble. I need, I need help. I'm in a, um, um, people are going to be after me. I need help. And again, back to the God job and the synchro destiny stuff, like who has that happen? 
and doesn't call the police. Like, right? So, right. As, as fate would have it, she was scheduled, she was, she was an active alcoholic who, was, who had called for help and had scheduled a 30-day detox for herself at a place called Crossroads for Wyndham, excuse me, Crossroads mm-hmm. for Women in Wyndham, Maine. <laughs> so she called them. <laughs> Yay, because the police weren't safe. <laughs> Well, but she didn't know that, you know, right, I, right. I, I don't remember if I, what I said to her, I don't, I, did I say, don't call my parents, don't call the police, right. please, please. I mean, I don't know, but I'm just thinking, she, wow. she, called, she called the, she called the detox place that she was scheduled to go to the next morning and said, Hey, I've got a 16, whatever old I was person in my house. And they said, bring her with you. So that night, I laid underneath her guest bed. So if Peter rushed the house, if he did, uh, if he went from house to house to house looking for me, if he rushed the house and went in, he wouldn't see me, you know? Oh my goodness. So I laid underneath and someone was shot that night. He, he did go on a rampage. I was worth a lot of money. And um, I was, I was his cash cow Eyes. and you know, but anyway, and then her husband parked the car. So it was blocking the door. Um, and that she opened the door in the morning and I, like, I like got into the car and got on the floorboard and the backseat on the floorboard and went to the, went to crossroads and crossroads was for alcoholic women mm-hmm. over 18 and it was a 30-day program. Crossroads let me stay there 90 days as a minor. I either turned 17 there or I was 17. Um, and they let me stay there 90 days, 17. And then I was supposed to, um, so they don't know what to do with me, right? right? So there's a place called Day One, which is, and what I'm telling you is important. So day one is a one year long program for kids. The other kids have to vote if they accept you to be a part of them or not. The first 90 days, you are allowed zero contact with the outside world. You can't call anybody. You can't receive mail. You can't walk to the mailbox. It's nothing. I don't care. You know, um, number one, I don't drink or drug. There's nobody that I want to be in contact with. Um, I already let my mom and my grandmother, I let people know I'm alive. That's all they need to know. They don't know where I'm at. They just know I'm alive. That's cool. Um, then, so the kids voted and the kids said, we're afraid you're going to have sex with everybody here. And I said, you know, you don't rape me and we'll get along fine. So they said yes. And I was scheduled to go the next day. Well, that night, the women in the house and I are watching TV before we go to bed, like we normally did. And I got a call from my dad. Um, not so they knew where you were well, to call. Well, somehow he, he figured that out. He must've got it. I don't know. Um, okay. so because I'm scheduled to go live for a year at day one. Okay. Um, but my dad calls and he says, I love you. I need you. Please come home. Now, my dad, I loved my dad, even though he was being a crazy person. Um, I love my dad. I had heard that before. I didn't want to go home and try to find women for him to have sex with or go through what I went through with him. Um, but there was synchro destiny, synchro destiny. When I talked to my dad, alarms went off inside of me. Like, like, um, the old world war two movies, like I, like everything in my body said, get to your dad. Now, 
right now, get to your dad. So I went to the night nurse and I said, I don't know what's going on. I have this emergency feeling that says I need to get to my dad. I'm in Maine, dad's in West Palm. It's right before we would come up um, to Maine. And uh, so she called the staff, you know, and said, what do I do? And they said, don't stop her, but don't help her. And it was planes, trains, and automobiles. And I got from Wyndham, which was no small feat. And I got, to, I got to Florida. I got to West Palm Beach, Florida. And the next morning, uh, I'm at the breakfast table with my dad. And I don't know how, how I can explain it, but his skin, his skin, he had like this egg sticking out of his skin and I'm like what's this and again my dad was a master electrician and he had worked on the Yankee um, nuclear power plant many years mm. before there was a radiation leak he did get radiation on him mm. I didn't know any of this at the time mm -hmm. um, so I said what is this and he said it's cancer and and I'm like, does anybody know? And he's like, you know, nope, I'm, I'm good. I know what it is. And he went to work. And I like opened up his, 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 uh, his address book. And I'm like calling people. And then they were calling him back that night when he got home from work. And he said, oh, she's just worrying. No, it's, n it's nothing. I'm fine. No big deal. And then um, it was time for us to, to drive up shortly, week or two, whatever, time for us to drive up to Maine. And um, we drive, and I'm leaving so much detail out, but we drive up, <laughs> drive up to Maine and his friends see him. And he looks like something from Auschwitz. He's all boned, he's skeletons. And they're like, Burke, you gotta go to the doctor. He goes to the doctor, comes back. And as I'm talking to you, I'm seeing the sun, I'm right on Sebago Lake, and I'm watching the sun dance on the top of the water. And when my, um, I was cleaning one of, the, one of the cottages before the next renters come. And, you know, I've got a homemade tattoo here. I've got a homemade tattoo here. I've got bleach blonde hair. Some of the remnants of the braces are still on my teeth. I smoke cigarettes like a sailor. I cuss like a sailor. I don't drink or drug. I'm... I'm a whack job. Um, but anyway, so I'm cleaning the, um, one of the cottages. Dad had just gotten back from the doctor and he comes out and the, just like this, the water, mm. the sun was sparkling on the water. And dad said, I have malignant melanoma from the top of my head to my toes. They're giving me two months to live. I've got to, um, uh, get my things, my spit kit and go back to the hospital. And this, what I'm about to tell you is really Im important because it, it changed my life and it's a great stopping point. Okay. So, um, so my, um, my sister, my, my, my brother and my sister have never been sexually abused in order to keep my sister safe. My grandmother paid for her to go to a Christian camp in New Hampshire, and she went from 10 to like 22 or 24 years old to this camp, um, which was great. Um, but now dad's dying. She's, um, I think she was seven. No, she was 10. I was 17. She was 10. And I'm saying that people need to go to New Hampshire and bring my sister back. I'm calling my mom saying, I know you're divorced, but you should come and say goodbye to my dad, to dad. Um, so this is happening. You know, I'm, I'm taking care of the camps. I'm got my grandmother there, my dad's brother there. My mother is coming up. Um, so we're all like trying to say goodbye to dad. So now it's, he was supposed to die three days, you know, before this moment, but he's, he's hanging on. Um, he's very happy that my mom is there because he loved my mom very much. 
I'm trying to figure out cancer stuff. Like I had him signed a do not resuscitate. They didn't even have those yet. It was a brand new sort of thing. Um, that was weird to have my dad sign this thing that I, the doctor told me about. <clears throat> so we were all exhausted. My brother went with his friends. My sister went down to my uncle's cottage. Mm. I didn't know that at the time. My mom is at the hospital with my dad. My uncle took my grandmother to, like, rest. And I go to my to the house to sleep. Um, we were all, it had been three days, we were exhausted. So when I went to sleep, I had um, a dream, a vision. And my dream said, you've got to get up, you've got to get to the hospital, they're not going to let you in the room. You're going to have to fight to get in the room. Get up. And I, I wake up. And there's a light on in my house. When I went to sleep, there were no lights on. I was the only person in the house. There's a light on. So one of the things I want to tell you is I had been beaten and raped and starved and brainwashed. And I am, um, I am a pathetic human being. I am, um, there, um, there was no boldness. I wasn't brave. I wasn't bold. I looked down, my shoulders were curved in. I looked like something a cat had thrown up. I was pathetic. So my dream telling me to do something assertive, how I lived, how I survived was by not being assertive. Okay. So this was no small ask, okay? So I have that dream. I wake up. There's a light on in the house. So um, I walk into the living room. There's the living room, and then there's um, a door to my dad's bedroom right beside the living room. I go into the living room, and there's my uncle with a big jug of vodka or gin, something see-through, and there's that much left. Oof. And remember, I think and react like a victim, okay? So my uncle says, he looks up and he says, hey, I know Burke is your old man, but he's been like a father to me too. And it's times like these that family members need to con need to console each other and comfort each other. I know what that means. I say, I can't, I'm gay. I figured it worked when my dad asked me for a blowjob. It might work now. He stands up with this smile on his face and says, then you will like this. And pulls me back into my dad's bedroom. He's doing his thing on me. So what does a what does a survivor, I told you this earlier, what is freedom? What is escape? Orgasm. He's not going to have an orgasm doing what he's doing. I have to get the hell out of here. My dream told me I have to get to the hospital. It's like 11 o'clock at night. Oh my God. So I pull him up and say something, you know, do me or whatever. What I knew would stimulate him to have his orgasm Faster. so I can get the heck out. And um, he laughs in my face. I still get a little um, nauseous. Um, uh, um, uh, um, he laughs in my face, uh, that smell, and has his orgasm, rolls off of me, 
and I go outside. This is not a public road. This is not a public business. This is a private business, private road, and there happens to be a car with kids in it. I have no idea, kids meaning teenagers, I have no idea who they were to this day. I don't remember any faces. I don't know who they are, but they're there. And I say, can I have a ride to the hospital? Think for destiny. Right. Say, sure. That's how I get a ride to the, to the hospital. Now pause for a moment. What I find out later is that my freaking little sister is, is in my uncle's freaking house with our cousin, right? I didn't know this at the time. So after he has his orgasm with me, he goes down. And meanwhile, while all this is going on, my sister is talking to my cousin and my cut because they're doing the sleepover thing. My cousin shares her journal with my sister that says every molestation that my uncle and aunt did to that child, their daughter, their daughter, my sister hides the book. My uncle leaves me staggers down to his cabin and because my dad had him be the caretaker. So we're in Florida in the wintertime and he lived there and like he was the caretaker. So um, he goes down and tries to have sex with her. She runs out of the house. He doesn't chase her because he's already had his orgasm. So that is the only molestation in my life that I am grateful for. <sighs> right? Yay. So I go to the hospital and in the hospital, this is important. I go to the hospital, the door is shut. I try to, I'm trying to, you know, open the door and I see my dad doing this, right? He's trying to pull his body off of his soul. So that <sighs> my aunt, my uncle's uh, wife, um, comes out, tries to, I don't know what it is with grabbing my wrist, but trying to take me down the hall. I break away from her. I'm being bold. I come back to the door. This is late, you know? Right, right, right. It's quiet, quiet. And my mom's got the door open and I, you know, say, you left dad. I stayed. I deserve to be here. You have to let me in. I'm not going anywhere good for you yeah. right ah! and so she lets me in I walk in and dad's bed is on the left and so on my dad's bed my mom is on one side I'm on the other and then the door and the wall back here my aunt is sitting there okay um I take my dad's hand and I just put my my face on his swollen hand and I'm just praying, please, God, please let dad die in peace. Please let him go. Please let him go. And I, I fall asleep. I can feel the urine bag against my leg. Um, I, I, I just pass out. This is, this is woo-woo stuff. It's okay. Something, something gripped me in my sleep and shook me violently like I was this to just, you know, oh my God, you know, to just wide awake and upright. Right. And I'm like, what the fuck? Right. And mom is there. And I'm telling you that my reality is time stood still. You would think when your daughter has that sort of uh, violent thing that you would look at her, you would say, are you okay? Something, but she did not move. I didn't hear any movement from my aunt behind me. I'm telling you, time stood still. And over to the right, there is an invisible person in the room. And again, I did not grow up religious. I don't know who is in the room, but somebody is in the room. And then I look over at my dad 
And I watch him breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Nothing. And I don't know how to describe this, but I felt my dad leave his body. And I knew, I don't know how, that he was beside whoever was in the room. Mm. And the two of them were in, were there. And in my mind, I said, thank you for letting him go to whoever the other person was. And in my mind, I told my dad, I'm sorry I was such a bad kid. And I love you. And I felt him say, I love you. I'm sorry. And then they were gone. And then I look over at my dad no breathing. And I'm thinking I'm in a fucking twilight zone movie. And then I go to say the word mom to my mom. I went to say the sound for M, the sound for mom. And as soon as sound came, time started. Mom looks at me and I say, he's gone. I stand up, I walk at the foot of his bed, I walk out the door, and and at the end of the long hallway in the hospital is the nurse's station, and I told you I was pathetic, I told you what I looked like, and the nurses treated me, and doctors treated me the way that I looked. Oh, so geez. it's it's two o'clock in the morning or something, it's August 9th, um, you know, um, 1981, and this is this is black. And the closer I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking. As soon as I get to the nurses station, it's black. My my hand slap down on the nurses station, and the nurse looks at me and says, "Can I help you?" I said, my father's dead. I'll let your nurse know. <laughs> my God. I, I look the way I look, right? Right. So um, now we teach forensic nurses that sometimes victims look like me. Right. So um, that is when I had my first massive panic attack massive the nurse told my mom that i was in shock but for the next 20 years i would be battling horrific post traumatic stress panic so my mom said i have to fly back home to my husband her husband in kansas she's bringing my brother and sister and she mm -hmm. said just get on the plane kathy I don't give a shit where you go, what you do, but at least let the family see you're getting on the plane with me. And so that is how I went to Kansas and started the next 20 years of my life, which is surviving the surviving. An interesting thing. Remember I said that day one was 90 days of no contact? Yes. It was 90 days from when I left huh. Crossroads for Wyndham to when my dad died. Wow. That 90-day period that I got to be with my dad and be there when he died, that spiritual experience that I had, which was one of many that happened over my lifetime, is the, is the mooring that kept me alive. Right. It's how I know that there's something beyond the veil. Yes. It's, it's knowing that I'm not alone. And these unseen, you know, beings yeah. um, constantly 
do things to let me know that I'm not alone, you know, what's going on, whatever. And that was the first thing. And then the second thing was Tony Robbins giving me hope by way of sharing these stories from all these people like I'm sharing with you now that said, maybe there's hope for somebody like me. So when my dad died was August 9th, right? I was pregnant and married to my stranger, my husband. I got married on, so dad died August 9th. I was pregnant and married on December 26th. Okay. And in, in this safety of that time period, because we know that the real war doesn't happen, the real hell doesn't begin until we're safe. Mm-hmm. So in Kansas, yeah. I'm safe, and that's when the post-traumatic stress, night terrors, chronic panic and anxiety, all of that, all of the healing, the whole healing journey started from that point. So, Gina, now you know a good chunk of the details of my first 20 years, the the two decades of wounding, and then you and I will have a conversation another time about the 20 years of surviving the surviving. Yes. Wow, Catherine. Wow. Wow. Just thank you, thank you for your vulnerability. I, I, it is truly for me unimaginable. I, I, I am so glad that you are alive, that you are have survived, that you had that spiritual experience that allowed you to have faith um, in something bigger. And I love you. I love you too. I'm so glad that you are here to guide others and let others know your, that if they are in any sort of prison as you were in all of those years, that if they hear any of this that allows them to keep going or to get help or to take a path or to see the signs, that is, that is, that is why we have to share our stories that it can be truly the key to unlock someone else's prison because thank God in heaven you are here and you have survived. And I look forward to hearing how you survived the survival in those years of what you've been through. You know, when, if anybody's watching this and they're, you know, they're, they're still in, having chronic panic and anxiety and they're like, boy, am I ever going to get over it? Um, you know, I was 47, I think, when the desire, you know, if God wanted to take me out, that would not, that would not suck for me. Like if God said, Hey, do you want to leave? I would absolutely say yes. Um, that was 40, I was 47 when, when I no longer wanted to do that. You know, I'm 56 and a half now, and I am the happiest I have ever been. So it was 20 years of trauma, 20 years of of, um, you know, healing and the whole uh, self-growth journey. Healing journey. And now, you know, I went on to make a six-figure income. I went on to buy my dream house on the lake. Um, it's been 12 years since I've had a post-traumatic stress episode or an anxiety attack or a panic attack. I've done so many bucket list things I can't even tell you. I'm in service, gladly in service now. My life has never been, uh, been better. Like, I've got the best girlfriends. I've got the best life. Um, uh, and if I would have, um, I wish somebody would have told me then that this is possible. And that's my Mm. hope is to be able to show you that you can endure it. You can heal it and you can absolutely thrive. So thank you for letting me throw that in. That is really important. That is the reason we are doing this. Uh, that is so important. So thank you. Um, thanks everyone for watching. Um, there will be a continuation. So take care of yourself. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And believe, believe everything can be okay. And uh, yeah. Love you, Gina. Love you too. Bye.